Recording and there's no in criteria progress. to use to say what's a good system, how would you reform it, what kinds of things would you want to come out the other end. Again, part of that is what we're bringing in to this review. So as the first bullet points out, each municipality must set its own terms of reference, its own parameters, establish guiding principles for the wards, and we'll see how that is integrated into the re review in Oro Medante. And the last part is that the, the review is typically framed around established procedures and principles. We, we don't borrow a lot, but we take pay attention to how things are done elsewhere. And we've adapted that to the circumstances in a municipality like Oro Medante and, and how other municipalities have organized their council. And we also know that in the past, these decisions were made by the Ontario Municipal Board, uh, now called the Local Planning Appeal Tribunal. Many of those decisions are important in helping us work out what a good system looks like and, and what kinds of things we need to be taking into account. I think I'm still doing the next one, right? <laughs> uh, so the primary purpose, purpose, and this slide will point out something we've just alluded to, the primary purpose of the study is to prepare Oro Medanti Council to make decisions on whether to maintain the existing electoral structure or to adopt an alternative arrangement. So the key part there is that it's council that makes decision. We don't. We offer insights. We hope uh, some evaluation. We provide some alternatives. Council gets to make the choice. Our role is to provide them with the kind of information they need to make a decision about what uh, the municipal council should look like ahead of the 2022 election. So the process uh, that we, we are following, uh, we had set that out, uh, as I said, uh, when we started, uh, we, we're in a, a phase, uh, the second part of this, uh, where we're doing preliminary boundaries. Population forecasting, data modeling go on all the time, but that's the key starting point for both our evaluation of the current system and our thinking about what alternatives might be appropriate. So that part has been going on. We're now with the development of preliminary ward boundary options. And the word preliminary is important because these are, if you will, a starting point. Uh, we've applied what we've learned uh, and, and what we've been able to, to uh, uh, bring to the evaluation. The next part will be to ask you in that third bullet, you the community to help us understand what we've got right, what we've got wrong, what's promising, what's not workable. Those are the things that the community itself must contribute to what we're doing. Uh, the, uh, the final part will though will be develop some final options for council to make that decision. And that will come uh, fairly soon after we've had a chance to do this review and final discussions with you and the community and council. We'll go over now to uh, to Jack. Thanks, Bob. Josh, if we can just go one slide back for one second, I just want to address some of those those questions. So we we talk about in the early part of our our review and in the first phase, we ask some questions, um, and and basically we we wanted to get an idea of how well does the present present electoral structure serve the residents of Oro Medante. Does that electoral structure provide fair and effective res representation? And would an alternative system provide better representation? And we kind of joke in the first round that if the answer to, to the first two questions was yes, then you know, there's not much left for the consultant team to do and we kind of pack our bags up and go home. However, if we find that the questions from those first two questions are no, then we do have to start to evaluate whether an alternative system would make more sense. So we really want to get into this next phase and start to answer those questions. Um, so that that's really, like I said, what the focus is on phase two. When we move to, to the, the next slide, there's some things that that you know Bob already touched on that we do to, to try to make that, that second phase successful. So in the first phase, I talk about the, the awareness and education and, and things that we did to do that were interviews with council, interviews with senior staff. And the municipality has a senior team that we've worked collaboratively with from the beginning of, of this process. And, and like I said, really for the consultant team to have that, that local knowledge available to them. 
Um, all of these sessions, all of the engagement, all of what we heard in the survey in the first round is really getting to the point that helps us inform uh, these preliminary options. Um, again, really quickly, some high level perspectives of that first phase. Um, when we look at the survey, we had about 200 people that participated in the survey. Uh, almost 150 of those 200 people answered the key questions. So that just means that not everyone answers every single question in the survey, but in this case, we had really good participation and good uh, response rate of those questions. Uh, about 60% of our respondents lived in Ward 1, so a little bit weighted towards 1, uh, but again, about 30% of the population in the town uh, in the township comes from that ward as well, and a pretty active ward from, from what we hear uh, from respondents and from staff as well. So that's just a little bit of, of what we did in phase one, like we said, to start to help us inform uh, where, where we're at now. So I'm gonna pass things back over to Bob. He's gonna talk to you a little bit about um, exactly what we heard uh, from clients or from, from constituents, and then get into uh, the evaluation of, of that phase one that, like I said, leads us into coming up with some of these preliminary options. Uh, Bob, back to you. Thank you, Jack. Now, these are very general uh, overview uh, sketches of what we heard, but there were four areas that we're highlighting here. Uh, and uh, these are uh, these are important to what we will what we've tried to do in coming up with preliminary op preliminary options and in what we would want to see going forward. First of all, for many respondents, put a high priority on equal on the equal representation by population principle. Population parity was was an important part, and it it features in the approaches that we take here because. It is a fairly important one. Very a fewer people, though, put the idea of a community of interest at the top of the list. Uh, it's important. About a quarter of the respondents said the wards should capture community of interest very well. But also there were uh, other responses, a little lower, that talk about future growth as opposed to the present population, and others about uh, trends. Uh, sorry, about geographical features. These are probably less important, but we take that to mean you need to have wards that, that are easy to identify, and there are some issues with the current boundaries in that sort. We also uh, ask a very broad question. Many people could interpret it, uh, people could interpret it in many different ways, but asking people whether they felt the current wards represented them uh, effectively, properly, clearly. Um, and about 57% said no, they didn't. The wards were not what they thought were a suitable arrangement, um, and about 43% said they were happy with that. And there are some inf there'd be some information uh, about whether that's distributed evenly across the municipality, but it certainly tells us that many people have some issues about the way the wards are currently set up. The third uh, box talks about this question of council composition. Just over half of the respondents felt that the council is fine at the size that it is. And there are, there are a number of reasons why people would come to that conclusion. Uh, but th there was a significant proportion, just over a third, who thought that there should be more councillors. And, and this is part of the dilemma of trying to fit everyone into five wards and meet the other principles. But only about 10% thought there should be fewer. So that's a, a bit of a wash. We're happy where we are. Uh, uh, and and the other views were were split, so we don't see an overwhelming sense that that the the size needs to change. Uh, beyond that, there were other comments, not not as uh, as extensive as as we might on the others, but talking about concerns over the representation of certain smaller communities within Oromodonte. How well are they are, are they represented? And without without getting into too many specifics, a, a number of times these would be, for example, uh, references to Moonstone, which is a, a, a self-contained uh, self settlement in the northern part of the township, separated by the major component of its, of its ward and feeling that perhaps they, they get overlooked in, in that. And bits of that in, a, in, a, in some of the other cases. So again, it's part of that community of interest perspective 
uh, that we heard from many, uh, from some of the other respondents. So what did we determine in phase one? That slide that follows, uh, slide 10, uh, gives us some sense of, of what we took away from the uh, assessment of the present ward system. Some of it, as we've suggested earlier, from our own analysis, uh, uh, our own study of, of the components of the municipality, population distribution, history, things of that sort. Part of it from the interviews we conducted with present and, and uh, past members of council and staff, and of course, from the um, responses of, of uh, residents in the municipality. So we had tried to work from the present system because if the question is, do you keep it or not? You need to know, is that the overwhelming view to keep it? Or do you say, well, let's keep these things and fix those other parts because we don't blow it up and start over again. We try to adapt it if, if that's the case because that's often an easier uh, direction for people to go. So we're asking ourselves these questions. Is it equitable? Do, do people have effective arrange, uh, representation uh, within the structure as it's set up? The current uh, system poses some uh, dilemmas for us. When we look at, at two or three key features, the population is not spread evenly throughout the township, uh, which re means there are population disparities between, ward, uh, between the wards, and particularly Ward 1, which is much higher than we would call our optimal range. If there are five wards, they should all be roughly 20% of the population. We discover that, that uh, in fact, Ward 1 is close to 30%. So that, that's an issue right there, fixing the population. The other, uh, the second bullet is, is a theme we've touched on already. The projections indicate that the population could be over 30,000 by 2031, and that, in fact, much of the growth is going to happen in, the, in that Ward 1 area or in areas that are already large. So, if you will, the growth is not going to correct things. The growth is not going to tilt things back and say we're, we're good. Uh, it will, in fact, only get worse. So, given that, that uh, future growth is one of the things we need to think about, uh, then we want to try to accommodate that. And then finally, uh, and this is the same point in a slightly different way, the con there's considerable considerable residential development in, in the, the Horseshoe Valley community and the immediate areas, but there are also important rural communities, uh, lakeside communities, others that have a unique history and a distinct identity that we believe should be captured in a ward system. So it's not just put the numbers up there, divide it up into an equal part and not really care where the lines go. We've got to build it around the history and the fabric, if you will, of, of Oro Medante uh, as, it's been in this, in, as it's been operating since 1994. Uh, the next slide uh, is a ver visual re representation of some of those same points. There is a population disparity. The chart on the left shows us uh, not just the present in the blue lines, but in, in the growth in the orange ones, so that the largest ward becomes even larger. The smaller wards don't become smaller, but we notice that ward two virtually doesn't change. So in relation to the other, uh, it, it, its position may change. And in the chart on the, on the right again is that uh, picture. Ideally, those would be five equal parts of that circle and we see that there is this distinction, wards running from 15% of the population to 31%. Okay, Pop optimal population. Am I going to you on this one, Jack, or am I finished? <laughs> am I still going on that? Okay, I'll, you, Bob. I, I'll go with it. All right, and we talked about this a few minutes ago, and I'll just walk through it very quickly. And when we look at the reports, uh, and, and the, the uh, figures that we're going to be showing you, there are some colors coded boxes, if you will, a chart with these colors in them. And they're a simple way of capturing the way that population is distributed. And the green band in the middle of this um, chart is, is the ideal. If we could end up with a system in which five wards were all in that green box, it would be, well, it'd be a miracle probably because that almost never happens. But that's the goal, get as many as we can 
into that range, which is what we call the optimal range. A target in 2021 of 5,198 people or 6,094 in 2031, within 5% of that. Those would be wards that are optimal. The further away you move, uh, the, the, the darker the color into the red. And our, our hope is that we don't have wards in those bright red categories because those are greater than 25% away from that optimal size. Sometimes that happens. Uh, and, and and we can talk a bit about why that might occur. But this is a quick way of summarizing. The goal is to get to that line in the center and we can accept the ones on either side up to 25%. We try to avoid the ones beyond that. Occasionally we have to see that happen, but uh, that's uh, because we've got other principles involved. Okay, so last thing for me here, the existing wards. Um, uh, many of you uh, on the call will will be quite familiar with what this looks like. Uh, and uh, the color codes there are picked up in those earlier slides. And again, we see certain characteristics to, to the outsider and maybe to, to many in, in the township uh, are, are striking. The first, of course, is the actual geographic size, the area of Ward 1, and we've already suggested that's the biggest population. Well, it's also the biggest area. It's it's a large area, but of course, in the center of it, or cutting across the middle of it is Highway 400. Is this really one place or is it two places? Uh, the current Ward 3 runs all the way from Craighurst down to Shanty Bay. It's quite a mix of communities, especially the, that rural area in the middle, but it's got two anchors, if you will, one at the north, one at the south. On the eastern side of the municipality, much of the growth is toward the edges, if you will, whether it be Warminster in the north or the, the communities closer to the, um, to the lake uh, down uh, uh, along the Ridge Road or, or even on Highway 11. So it's, it, when we look at it, we can see some interesting features, uh, uh, but they don't necessarily all contribute to a, a good system. And uh, there's a couple other things I'll mention then when we come back to talk about preliminary options over to Jack. Thanks, Bob. So thanks for that that evaluation, because I think it really hits uh, home in terms of the things that we try to look at, not only in terms of the existing system and how we evaluate that, but everything that Bob talked about, we then carry forward to evaluate our preliminary options as well. So ultimately where we're at now is, is we ask one of the bigger questions do the that I, I talked about earlier, do the wards need to be changed? And I think after you listen to what Bob spoke about, our answer is yes. Again, we don't think this is a this is not a ward system or, or electoral system that is completely uh, malfunctioning or completely broken. We we definitely see a lot worse in our work, but I think what we pointed out were were definitely some issues and some tensions with the existing system that we think by looking at some alternative designs could probably be fixed or at least addressed. Um, so we do think that that it's worthwhile to consider some preliminary options. Uh, we do think that effect, a better effective representation might be achieved, uh, at least in terms of, of uh, evaluating that against the core principles we spoke about tonight. Um, so basically what we're, what we're gonna talk about in a couple of minutes when we start to show you the preliminary options um, is, is what we wanna, uh, or just now before we get into that, we just want to be sure uh, in terms of, of some of the things we looked at when we came up with those preliminary options. So um, obviously public engagement and, and speaking to council and speaking to town staff all come into the development of these options. It's basically analyzing and summarizing all the qualitative and quantitative data to come up with options. Uh, we also want to be considerate of a couple of other things. We want to be considerate of not only our best practices and things that we may have done in other places, but also case law. And, and when we talk about case law, we really talk about a couple of things. There's, there's obviously a very important Supreme Court decision that has to do with board boundary reviews and the idea of effective representation. That's the Carter case. And those, a lot of the core principles we talk about stem from that case. But as well, there have been countless uh, Ontario Municipal Board, now referred as LPAT, and I think this week the name just changed again, 
the name escapes me right now, it's a moving target, but, but there is a tribunal that looks at these matters as well. So all these bylaws that get passed, the ward band review bylaw that gets passed can be appealed to, to LPAT. And, and based on those decisions, certain uh, themes come from that. So obviously we take that into consideration as well. The last point I wanna make is what Bob just touched on, even with regard to, to that optimum population. It's very difficult, it's almost impossible to have wards that are gonna be all in that optimum population. It's very difficult and again, almost impossible to have a ward system that is gonna completely check all of the core principles. A lot of times it does become a little bit of a balancing act or um, a trade-off, if you will. Bob touched on one uh, a point a minute ago, ward one, largest population, largest geography. However, if we did something to, um, you know, or, or we'll use another example. Typically when we, when we look at large areas, we would rather have a smaller population recognizing that, um, you know, the practicality and on the ground reality of the counselor doing that job has a large geographic area to cover. So again, a trade-off may be you have a large rural area um, we want to recognize that. We want to recognize the, the practicality, like I said, of, of the counselor's job. But the trade-off might be you might not be able to have the population parity that you want in, in that area. So again, we try to check and, and meet the guiding principles in a uniform way as much as possible. But there's going to be, and, and we'll see this when we walk through the preliminary options, there's going to be cases where one uh, guiding principle might be weighted, and, and again, not in any official sense, but might be weighted a little bit less compared to another guiding principle. If we move to the next slide, uh, a couple of things just touching on, on what that alternative system might look like and really going back to some of the things that Bob talked about in terms of feedback. Uh, when we look at, at what we heard, almost 50% of the survey respondents wanted a system that prioritized representation by population. When we look at future population and electoral trends, another 15%, it really tells us that almost 65% of, of, the, of the municipality's population wants a system that recognizes population both today and in the future as well. But like Bob said, it wasn't 0% for the other guiding principles. There was still almost a quarter that still wanted us to recognize communities of interest and about 15% that wanted to ensure that those boundary lines are clean, identifiable and used natural and man-made features. Um, so again, just an idea of, of what we heard and what goes into some of our thinking uh, for the preliminary options that we'll look at shortly. If we move to the next slide, we're gonna finish off today just with a few next steps and a reminder of, of what the public can continue to do to provide us additional feedback. So uh, right now, um, actually today, the preliminary options report was released on the municipality's website. So anyone that wants to go and get some more additional detail and, and more information can check out the preliminary options report. A lot of what we talked about in this presentation, as well as the actual options and commentary around those options are, are in there. Um, please continue to provide feedback. Uh, participation has been great so far, and we hope that continues, uh, especially in this most important part uh, of the study where you actually get to look at the preliminary options and let us and council ultimately know what your preferences are. And like I talked about a little bit earlier, ultimately the next step now in July is going to be developing final recommendations and presenting those recommendations to the council. So to finish off tonight, if we move to the last slide, Again, visit the webpage for the project. Um, that is really the central warehouse. And then you see that at the top of the screen, oromedante, oro-medante.ca um, forward slash WBR. And really everything is there, whether it be historical reports, the new uh, uh, report I talked about today, surveys, um, uh, FAQs, it's all really there. So as much as, uh, as little and as much as you wanna dive in, um, you can do so. Continue to ask questions, so please ask questions of, of us tonight, um, and, at, and we have another couple of sessions on Thursday afternoon at 3 and another one Thursday evening again at 7. Uh, read the reports that I talked about and, and get informed and educated about this process. We feel that the more you know about the process, the better communication and input 
you can provide. Uh, also on the website, there's an interactive mapping tool. So there's a little box on the website called mapping. And if you click on that, it brings you to a little tool um, that you can click and you can put in your address, find where you live, click on the different options and you can see exactly how the lines change and how it impacts your ward and, and where you live. Uh, the survey we've spoken about a couple of times tonight, I, I often say, if you only do one thing to participate in this, please go to the survey and answer the survey questions. It really gives the consultant team a really consistent form of feedback. So again, if, if that's the only thing you do in, in this process, uh, please answer the survey and get the word out. Um, you know, we really rely on, on residents to, uh, to you know, tell their friends, tell their families, tell their neighbors that this study is going on. It's an important study that's going to impact and affect the way that you elect future councils. Uh, so the more that you know and the more people that, that know about this, uh, the more feedback and, and the, again, the better recommendations ultimately that will come to your council. So that's it in terms of the presentation portion of tonight. Uh, but like I said, we are going to move right into the preliminary options. Uh, and what we're going to do uh, tonight is uh, we're going to give a quick description of each of the option. Uh, I'll introduce them and then Bob will provide some of his expertise with regard to our thinking and some highlights of each option. And then after each option, we'll give uh, anybody on the call a chance to provide any comments and questions if they wish. Um, and then at the end of all the options presented, we'll allow uh, for some feedback as well. Okay, welcome back. Um, so I hope everyone found that informative. And uh, we, as I mentioned at the end of the presentation, we are going to now jump into looking at the preliminary options. So I'm just gonna give uh, my colleague Josh a minute to bring up our, our options. Um, while he's doing that, any questions or comments from anybody participating on the Zoom call so far? Okay, great. So we're going to jump right into those options. So um, like I mentioned at, at the end of the presentation, um, the preliminary options that we've designed are really meant to get feedback. Um, you'll see that we considered different things in, in many of the options, looked at the, at the municipality in a couple of different ways, again, to try to see what the community feels about um, if we associate a certain community of interest with you know, the southern part of the municipality or the northern part of the municipality. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so that's really the, the feedback that we're trying to get out of, out of these preliminary options. Um, there are a total of six um, that we're going to walk through, um, but four, really four. And, and what I mean by that is two of the options are what we tend to refer to as B options. So they have some association with the A option, some sort of theme, or, or it might be a minor modification to, to that option. So it's not a completely different preliminary option, but it's attached somewhat to the A option. And that'll make more sense as we walk through the options. Before we uh, get into the actual options, really quickly, um, what you see on your screen right now, just a reminder of the guiding principles that we talked about at the beginning of tonight's session and in the presentation as well, brought them up just so we have a reminder of, of some of the framework that we use um, that Bob spoke about both when we evaluated the existing system and when we look at, at the uh, options as well. If we move to the next slide, again, quick reminder of what your existing system looks like, five wards. Um, again, just a quick visual. So when we start to look at some of the proposed options, you can kind of visualize and bring it back to how it compares to your existing system. So with that, I'm going to jump into the first preliminary option. So number one. So a couple of things to highlight here. We, we call this our minimal disruption option. And the reason for it is some of the things we talked about in the presentation. We've definitely highlighted some issues um, uh, we found with the existing existing system, but we did find that it was completely broken. We found that possibly with a few fixes and a few changes here or there, we might be able to address some of those issues. So, um, so, so again, hence the minimal disruption. You'll see some fami familiarity with your existing system. One of the biggest differences, and I, and I think right in the middle, uh, pretty much, you'll see that Horseshoe Valley is contained within one ward. So I would say that's the biggest difference from your existing system to what we've proposed here. And as a result, you'll see a shift in the south as well, moving from three wards to two wards. From a population parity perspective, 
Most of the wards are in the acceptable range. However, you will notice that ward three, and that's the Horseshoe Valley ward I just referred to, is well below the acceptable range in 2021, about 42% of the optimum population. However, if you look forward to 2031, you see that with the growth expected in Horseshoe Valley, expected to more than double in population, that that ward grows into parity, and that in 2031, all of the five proposed wards are in the acceptable range, and three are actually in, in very good population parity, only about 3% higher than the optimum. Bob, some other perspectives to add on this option? You're on mute, Bob. Thank you. Uh, one of the uh, issues, of course, in every design is to, once we make a certain kind of decision about how to approach it, other things have to be arranged around that. In this case, as we've indicated, if we try to work with a single ward that is coherent in the sense that it, it captures uh, the Horseshoe Valley community and does not cross Highway 400, other things have to flow from there. And one of the ongoing issues, of course, is, let's say, the relationship of Craighurst to the rest of the municipality. In this case, uh, we've placed it in uh, a northern ward, which actually brackets the Horseshoe Valley ward that we're talking about here. That is a, a bit of a change from, well, maybe a significant change from the present, but it, it's partly trying to balance off population, as we've suggested, and working within connections that are already there. Uh, Sugar Bush, Moonstone, again, across the highway, but, but some ongoing connections that we've heard about. The main uh, other change, of course, here is that this uh, scenario involves two wards in the southern part in, in, the, in the former Oro Township uh, along the, uh, the Lake Simcoe shore, as opposed to three. But the wards that are here are quite different in shape uh, and, and capture a group of communities that are reasonably uh, close to one another and have a, a, a level of, of connection that we feel is valid. Again, the outcome in 2031 is a very strong uh, feature of this design, getting to population parity in three of the five wards, uh, sorry, within the optimal range within three of the five wards is a very strong uh, reason for looking at this seriously. Thanks, Bob. Any uh, questions before or comments before we move on to option two about what we just looked at in option one? Okay, and like I said, if there's anyone that wants to type anything in, we'll be looking at, at, those, uh, at that chat as well. So if we move into option two, 2A two actually, so this is one of the scenarios where I mentioned where we have a 2A and a 2B. Um, so we'll focus on the 2A first. So again, um, if we think about uh, what we just talked about in option one, where one of the main differences was a, a horseshoe ward, a uh, horseshoe valley contained completely within one ward. Uh, but we, we talked about the population imbalance that that causes in the short term until horseshoe valley grows, in, uh, grows out. Um, so in this ward, we tried to, in this option, we tried to address that. And you see that Horseshoe Valley is put in with Sugarbush, and that ward becomes a, a larger ward with those two main communities anchoring that. And you see that it has uh, an obvious impact on the population, uh, bringing it into the acceptable range. Uh, the other thing I'll mention in this option is I'll, I'll point your uh, eyes to the western part of the municipality, uh, the eastern part, sorry and between wards one and two and the Warminster area. So again, we're using Warminster side road as a boundary between wards one and two, a uh, pretty uh, good arterial road, identifiable, provides us with a good boundary. However, you'll notice that Warminster side road goes right through uh, the hamlet or community of Warminster. Um, so again, you know, we want some feedback on whether that is something that's acceptable or not. Um, and, and we'll discuss it a little bit further in option 2B. That's one of the things we, we try to address. But those are, are some of the highlights of 2A. You'll see that in terms of population parity, again, five of the six wards in 2021 are in the acceptable range, one ward in the optimum range. Ward five uh, in the southeast corner, slightly outside of the acceptable range, but only about 28% compared to our acceptable variation of 25%. Uh, in 2031, that ward comes into the acceptable range as the some of the other parts of the municipality grow around it. However, ward one 
um, being a more stable population in this scenario actually falls a little bit below that optimum or that acceptable range. Bob? Some of the uh, features of this, of course, are similar to the existing system. Uh, the idea of a northern ward that crosses uh, the municipality, uh, part of it crossing over Highway 400, keeping Moonstone and, and uh, to some extent Warminster uh, in the same uh, ward has, has some uh, uh, continuity there. Uh, as, and more importantly, the Craighurst Shanty Bay uh, orientation, the north-south orientation of Ward 4 is very, very similar to the current system. Uh, as, as Jack points out, Ward 3, instead of keeping Horseshoe Valley isolated in its own ward, it reaches out to its neighbor uh, to the east, the Sugarbush area, and, and puts those together again under uh, Highway 400. One of the other ideas here is, is to move away from those wards along the lakeshore that, that run in a north-south direction, if I can call it that. And we did play around with the idea of something broader across the south, but the Ward 5 um, is a way to capture that continuous uh, string of settlement along Lake Simcoe in a single ward rather than dividing it up. So it, it has, again, echoes of, of the past and echoes of, of, a, of some other future options. Thank you, Bob. Any comments, questions on 2A? Okay, we're gonna keep motoring along. So moving to 2B, so the B option of this scenario. So I'm gonna quickly point out uh, the three main changes that we made compared to 2A and 2B. So I talked uh, about that Warminster side road as a boundary in option 2A and how it goes through that community of Warminster. So one of the things we addressed here was that. So we actually, that you can see that the boundary line follows Warminster side road until it reaches uh, the settlement area of Warminster and then it jogs south and follows the settlement area. So again, when we talk about trade-offs, that's gonna be a harder line to identify as a ward boundary. However, it does keep the entire community of Warminster contained within one ward. So that's the kind of feedback that we wanna hear. Would we rather see a, a cleaner line We'd rather see the community kept within one ward. Uh, the other change here is uh, what Bob touched on in 2A. We have Craighurst similar to the existing system associated with the ward in the south. Here, similar to option one, we bring it up into ward one. So that's the second change. Uh, and then the other change we have here is if you look at the southeast portion of ward two, um, where it now extends down east of line 14 south all the way to uh, Lake Sipco. Um, and as a result of these changes, you see a more compact Ward 4 as well. Uh, Bob, some other things to add here? Well, again, as, as we move through these uh, options, we can see how making one adjustment leads to the need to make others. And in this case, of course, Ward 3 is the continuity and the things around it move. Do we, do we see Craighurst as having more affinity with the areas to the north or the south, uh, how far should that lakeshore area be divided, or how, how often should it be divided? Uh, in this case, it's three parts, as in the current system, but in the, at a different balance, if you will, uh, moving uh, uh, that that ward five into that smaller range, but uh, sorry, smaller size. But as we can see, ending up with quite a good population distribution. Let's go back very quickly to that boundary between one and two, Warminster Side Road is an identifiable boundary. It's not exactly a straight line, uh, but it is a, an identifiable boundary. Uh, and, and some might say, well, why don't you just draw a straight line across there? The problem then, of course, is that what we'd be doing is, is cutting across various properties that could be a part of the property in one ward and part in another. So trying to work with lines that are based on the roadways as much as possible, avoid that kind of difficulty. Thanks again, Bob. Okay, any questions, comments on 2B? Okay, so moving on to preliminary option three. So when we look at option three, a lot of similarities to what we just looked at in 2B, especially in the northern part of the municipality and, I, and wards one and two, I think aside from a, a very small area are practically the same as in option 2B. Um, what we really dealt with here is, is the center and south of the municipality. 
Um, so you see a Ward 3 that's fairly large, uh, runs the east-west portion of the municipality, uh, comes in north of Horseshoe Valley Road, right up to Warminster Side Road, and you see a Ward 4 and a 5 that are more compact. Um, so again, a, a large Ward 3, I think, is, is one of the differences between some of the other options we've looked at. However, when we look at population parity here, and down at the bottom, no reds, um, so no, no bright reds, which means we're outside that 25% range. All of the wards inside the acceptable range, both in 2021 and taking into account future growth and, and 2031 as well. So again, very good population parities. Um, uh, however, you know, uh, a, a big ward three, um, I guess, as a trade-off to, to achieve some of that parity in population. Bob? Well, it's a big ward three in geography, but not in population, of course. So what this uh, ward looks like is essentially something built around Old Berry Road, becoming the, the, if you will, the spine of that ward. Uh, and of course, even to uh, keep the population in balance in the other wards, we've ended up going relatively far north, but it's basically oriented uh, in, in the opposite direction, if you will, to the way the current Southern wards run uh, which, which I think of as north and south, although it's not quite that neat. Uh, but, but this is turning it in another direction, leaving again the idea of Craigers uh, associating with the north, as we found in a couple of the other options, a slight reduction in the Ward 2, uh, but, but again, very strong parity uh, in, in population in both the short and the long term uh, that, that has, a, again, some merit to it. And let's just re remind everyone that these are preliminary options. It's a, it's a starting point for a conversation about what, what these might look like. Thanks, Bob. Okay, so those are, uh, we've presented four of the options so far. So options one, two A, two B, and three. And we have two options left to present, but I just wanna pause for a second because as we move, move into preliminary options four A and four B, they're a little bit different from what we've presented so far. So we talked that this is not only a ward boundary review, but part of our scope and part of our task was to also look at council composition, the size of council, whether that size um, still made sense for the population, for the issues we've identified in Oral Medante. Um, so as a result, <clears throat> excuse me, I think we talked a little bit about this in the presentation um, and, and some of the survey results. We did hear from the public in terms of, I think about 50%, and I don't have the numbers right in front of me, there's about half that thought that that council size was just fine the way it was. I think it was about a third that thought, yeah, we could entertain a, a larger council um, to, to accommodate our population both today and, and what's expected to occur over the next decade. Um, so that was one reason we thought a third of the population asked us to look at considering a larger number of council. The other thing, it goes back to the guiding principles, the core principles that we talked about, and, and some of the issues that we've highlighted um, in the five ward options that we talked about. So we also said, if we look at additional wards, might it alleviate some of the issues that we can't necessarily fix under the five ward system? So the, the next two options consider a six ward approach rather than the existing five ward approach. However, I do want to take another second just to talk about it. And I'm going to give Bob a chance to speak here as well. But there's a couple of things that we should discuss before we get into the actual six ward options. So the obvious one is in a six ward option, we are asking residents and council ultimately to consider increasing council size by one. There are certain implications that come with increasing council size. One of the obvious ones is costs. Um, so obviously you would have to pay an extra a, a counselor, an extra salary, extra expenses, potential offices and resources and anything that would come along with an additional counselor. So we wanted to be careful to, or just to ensure that we highlight that to uh, the residents and, and to council. The other thing that we want to talk about um, with regard to moving to a possible six ward option with a deputy mayor and a mayor is that the number of your council would be eight. And we've heard from residents, we've heard from councils, from, from staff, 
not only in this ward boundary review, but in many other ones that we've done, that that is going to result in an even numbered council. And there may be um, some, some implications of an even numbered council. So at this point, I am going to pass it over to Bob. And Bob, maybe you can just touch a little bit on uh, that even numbered council, whatever, and, and the increase of size of council, but maybe with a focus on, on you know, even numbered councils. Do they exist in Ontario? Um, you know, how much of an issue do you foresee this to be in comparison to everything else we're talking about? Okay, Jack, this is uh, one of those areas that is really unspecified. It's a matter of local practice. There are many who believe that having an odd number uh, is, is a better way to ensure that decisions can be made. The fear is that an even number uh, could result in a, a kind of deadlock along the way where matters that cannot be passed because it, they can't, it, a majority is not easy to reach. That assumes, of course, that the members of council are divided in such a way that they would end up in this scenario, four on one side and four on another on some kind of ongoing basis. That's something that the wards, I think, are not going to be, uh, it's not the fault of the wards that that might happen. Uh, and it's as much a matter of how the, the councillors who are elected in that system uh, are prepared to operate and, and reach, uh, if you will, consensus around matters rather than being in this kind of sharp head-to-head, uh, -head, always divided down the middle scenario. The other part, though, is that this is a practice. The idea of even numbers does happen. And best we can tell from data we've collected from, I think, the Association of Municipalities of Ontario is that it's anywhere between 40 and 50 municipalities. Not a majority, but a significant number operate with an even number. Uh, and, and in fact, two very large, two of the largest municipalities in Ontario, Ottawa and Hamilton, both have even numbered councils. Uh, so it's not that it's something that only happens in very small places. The other element, of course, is that even if there are, shall we call them tensions between council, it, it may very well be that in an even number, uh, somebody might be uh, unavailable for a, a certain meeting or may have to declare a, a, a pecuniary interest and step back. Uh, so a, a, an even number council could end up with an odd number. Conversely, an, an odd number council for the same reasons could end up at an even number. So I don't know that we want to get too far into building this whole thing around these possible scenarios. Yes, they could happen, but they are not insurmountable. And, and in many ways, they really are putting the onus on those people who are in, elected in it to help govern in the interests of the whole municipality. Certainly in many cases we've heard, uh, there are very seldom situations where a council is divided that drastically that there is this sort of deadlock. It can happen, but I don't, I don't believe that the system should be built around uh, having to meet that one way or the other. We're recommending an additional, a, 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 an additional ward partly to help us address the very questions that we're asked to look at, the population distribution in the present and in the future. So uh, this is part of, if you will, the, the trade-off that you need to make. If you get another counselor, it can help address representation and those other things may or may not happen. Thank you, Bob. I think that's helpful. The, the last thing I want to uh, touch on is related to council size and, and particularly what we just spoke about and increasing, if we increase wards, do you have to increase council size? So one thing that we um, raise in our final, in, in our preliminary options report is a discussion about deputy mayor. And, and, and this has come up in a few other places we've worked in and uh, some of the feedback and some of the discussion is instead of increasing uh, the size of council by one, can the deputy mayor position be um, not necessarily eliminated, but can they run as a local ward councillor and can the deputy mayor position then be selected amongst those from amongst those local councillors? So what we're basically saying is you still go to six wards, but your council still remains at seven um, because the deputy mayor position is not a position that would be elected at large. Now, I do want to say, and I'll let Bob jump in uh, here as well, I do want to say that this is something that we have explored because there is some, I'm trying to think of the best word, maybe not uh, some 
legislation that is a little bit unclear in what direction the municipality can take. Um, for example, the we feel that the Municipal Act gives municipalities authority to make that change, and we have worked in other municipalities where that has in fact happened. However, there are other aspects of legislation that says that the second representative, and just to be clear here, uh, right now your mayor and your deputy mayor sit also on county council and represent Oro Medante at county council. And there's legislation that says that second representative, the deputy mayor in this case, needs to be elected at large. So those are some, you know, and, and right now in the county of Simcoe, all the other municipalities have a mayor and a deputy mayor that's elected at large, and they both represent uh, those municipalities on county council. So there is another possibility here um, by of going from five to six wards and not increasing council size, not having an even numbered council. However, I think it's fair to say that that change is a little bit, un or the authority for that change is a little bit muddled right now. Bob, anything to add to that? Yes, this has been an interesting discussion uh, here in Oro Medante and in another Simcoe County municipality where we've been uh, working on these scenarios because there was a discussion many of you would be aware of that went on at County Council uh, for some months, actually, maybe years, about whether uh, the idea of having two representatives per municipality was the right way to go. And, and uh, in the end, uh, that was not changed. Uh, and so there are the two positions that to be the, to be filled. If that position, if the municipality was to only have one, then the question of what do you do with a deputy mayor? And we allude to that a bit in our earlier uh, uh, reports, trying to think out loud. Now that it's clear that yes, there will be two, the idea of changing from uh, a separately elected position, which is where the the uh, the uh, final place comes in, in current system, the the uh, uh, seventh place, uh, to something that is a choice from within the existing council is not without, uh, if you will, serious debate. Uh, if you changed it, the only people who could ever be deputy mayor in any given term are the people who already got elected to council, uh, rather than having anyone who lives in the municipality run for that office. That's a, you know, that's a, that's a reasonable trade. Uh, and again, in the in Simcoe County, if if Oro Medante were to say, let's choose our deputy mayor from amongst our councillors, uh, it, it looks at the moment like that would be the only place where that happens. But again. It is permitted, as best we can tell, under the Municipal Act. Uh, it's not a common practice, but it could be a way to get around the problem, saying six wards will help us achieve some things, but we don't necessarily have to have that other that other position. And as Jack said, uh, we've had some discussions with the county clerk and elsewhere because the County of Simcoe Act says the mayor and deputy mayor, but that act is now repealed. Uh, so it can't be amended, but there is a provision in the Municipal Act itself that allows for a change of that sort. So it's not clear at this point whether uh, the Municipal Act can override it. I personally believe from what I've looked at that that is possible, but you know, it's, it's almost a case of saying we can, we can deal with, we can cross that bridge when we come to it. If there's buy-in for six wards, but no interest in uh, increasing the council, then that matter could be addressed more directly. Well put. Okay, so going back to the preliminary options, I know that was quite the uh, the breathful of an aside there, but I think it was an important um, aspect of the these additional wards that had to be talked about and, and had to be uh, considered. So the first six ward option we're looking at is our 4A option. Uh, I'll, I'll be really quick with a couple of highlights here. Um, so. What it does is affords us really, um, gives us the ability to have, in a sense, three Northern wards and three Southern wards in the municipality, albeit that ward three is a bit of a mix it, because it does include Craighurst and it does, you know, similar to another option we looked at, it is, it runs the East-West course of the municipality. So again, 
a fairly large ward in terms of geographic area. Um, some similarities to some of the other options we see, uh, those two uh, southern wards, all uh, south of side road 15 and 16. Uh, and then we see that those three sort of northern wards, ward four becomes a little bit more compact here, ward one becomes a little more compact. And that's probably one of the things we see here is, is we're able now to take two of those three northern wards and make them a little bit more of a compact more manageable geographic area while still having pretty decent population parity. Uh, really, there's two wards, wards one and wards two, only in the 2031 that get a little bit outside and a little, a little bit high and a little bit low. But again, not well outside the acceptable range. Ward one, about 0 0.7, 0 0.75 is what, where we would like it. And ward two, about 1.27, 1.25 is where we would like it. Bob? Yeah, th this is again borrowing aspects of others. Once you make a decision, let's say we'll start with, with uh, the ward two as the core because that's where most of the growth is going to happen. Combining Horseshoe Valley and Sugar Bush creates a certain uh, uh, corner of the of the municipality that we work around, uh, and it means that, uh, uh, as we said earlier, the line is drawn using a pl uh, plausible roadway rather than uh, some other magical line that we draw across country. And of course, that doesn't give us a lot of flexibility. Yes, the, the proposed Ward 2 is slightly large uh, by 2031, but not an unreasonable uh, uh, imbalance. But it again, it's a relatively compact ward, so that the, the idea of representing that area does not involve vast distances to travel and areas that are if you will, somewhat remote from, from uh, the, the core settlements. This again captures that uh, uh, pathway along Old Berry Road. In this case, rather than taking it up on the eastern side, it's on the western side. Craighurst is already in a ward that runs uh, down toward uh, the south. This is, is uh, taking it across uh, in another direction, but a, a, uh, one that, that is, is a really good uh, balance for all of this. And, and I think, again, that's one of the selling points in the sixth ward. Trying to get a better balance seems to, to be possible in six, more so than, uh, uh, than some of the fives. And let me just also say, we did not consider reducing the number of wards either. Uh, I mean, that, that I suppose you could stay the same, get bigger. You could get smaller. I think it's pretty easy to see. If you tried to carve this up into four parts, you would get very large geographic areas, the possibility of a great disparity in the population and really not a plausible way to go about um, uh, electing a, a council for Oro Medante. Great, thank you, Bob. Uh, any questions, comments on our 4A option? Okay, one more to go. So our 4B option, as, as I spoke about, so this is our second of the B options, um, also a six ward option to consider. And um, I guess the, the main difference here, it relates all the way back to what we talked about in option one. In this six ward option, again, we look at what it would look like with Horseshoe Valley um, in, contained in one ward. And like Bob talked about, once you start there, a lot of other things kind of fall out from, from that first assumption that we make. Um, you'll see that, uh, you know, a couple of other things, you see that Ward 6 um, in, in the southeast corner of the municipality gets very compact. Uh, you see that Ward 3, that we joke about this, becomes a bit of a horseshoe around Horseshoe. Um, and from a population parity perspective, definitely more of a focus on the future. Um, you see that in 2021, all of the wards except the Horseshoe Ward, similar to uh, the option one, are in the acceptable range. Uh, horseshoe at about half of, of the acceptable range. But we see as that population grows out, um, even at, um, at, and you'll see that in the 2031, we have four of the six wards in the optimum range, a couple within a few percent of, of that optimum number. And even the two that fall outside are just very slightly outside the optimum range. So, you know, I, I said this the other night when we were presenting for a six ward option, um, that's probably one of the best or at least better population parity options we've designed to date. Um, it just 
for, for various reasons that I think we've tried to highlight tonight, it rarely ever kind of just works out like that um, while you're still trying to recognize the other guiding principles. So that's really a focus of this one is very good population parity in the next decade as, as Horseshoe and some of those other communities uh, build out and grow out. Bob? One of the things that happens in this particular scenario is that some of the communities along major roadways, whether it be Horseshoe Valley Road, Old Berry Road, or, or, uh, or some of the others are not divided. Uh, in, in a couple of other instances, uh, communities line, uh, along some of the roadways we've used uh, end up uh, being, um, we'd have to make adjustments around them one way or the other. This at least places those, many of those places, uh, wh whether it be uh, Edgar or Rugby or, or uh, some of the others uh, in a single ward and, and that reduces that kind of issue of, of uh, uh, community of interest that being under some uh, strain, if you will, in the system. This one, of course, is, uh, uses Highway 11 as a boundary, which in other cases, we've grouped communities, neighborhoods on either side of it. In this case, it's a pretty significant roadway. There's no reason why it shouldn't be a boundary. But as I said earlier, we, we will admit right now, we did try out, what if we use that from one side to the other and found that it's really not a it doesn't work in population terms and various other reasons when you then try to do the other activity. So this is one that, that uses Highway 11 uh, and keeps that, that Lake, uh, Lakeshore area in a reasonably compact ward. Thanks, Bob. So those are our six options. Uh, one, 2A, 2B, 3, 4A, 4B. Um, so I hope we did a, a pretty good job of walking you through those and sort of trying to explain our thinking and the differences really about what we were trying to, to show and some of the outcomes of each option. Um, so now that everyone's had a chance to look and, and see all the options, uh, for our participants on our call, um, on, on the Zoom call, any questions, any comments, any, anything anybody wants to say? Okay. Well, I'm, I'm just going to finish off with, with a couple of things before we sign off for the day. So first off, I really just want to thank uh, the participants on the call, as well as everybody watching today uh, for taking your time out. It's a beautiful day out there, so we're really glad that you can take uh, some time uh, out of that to uh, learn a little bit about this composite council composition and ward boundary review. The more that you know, the better feedback I think that you can give, um, and, and you know from that, the more informed and, and more viable options that we ultimately can present to your council. So in terms of some next steps, really just a reminder of, of what I talked about at the end of the presentation today. Um, there's a few things that, that we ask the public um, to do in terms of feedback. Uh, the best way to go about it is to go to the municipality's website. And I think uh, in a second, Josh will bring that up so everybody can see that. But it's uh, oro medante uh, .ca forward slash WBR. And there you can really uh, get a chance. It's, it's like I said, it's a central warehouse for all the information. So you can go and, and you see it up there now. You can go and uh, watch videos. You can read reports. You can um, check out the interactive mapping that we talked about. You can you know, email the clerk if you want to give us feedback that way. Um, so there's a bunch of different things you can do. If you only do one thing, like I talked about in the presentation, you can see there's a couple of links. There's the phase two survey there, uh, and where Josh just highlighted, you can click on the icon as well. If you do one thing, fill out the survey. It's a really good way for us to get good, consistent feedback and, and able to analyze uh, those results in, in a good, efficient way. Um, so that's, that's you know like I said, if there's only one thing, please click the survey. But if you have some time, please check out the other materials because as I mentioned, the more you know, the easier it'll probably be to, to give feedback. Um, there is one more session tonight at seven. So if you wanna come and join us again, or if you wanna tell some friends and family, um, please do so. And uh, the, at the survey is going to be up for about another week or so um, on the website. And uh, we will come back with a final report to council with some final options in July. So again, thanks everybody for taking the time out to attend today. Hope you have a wonderful afternoon and night. Bye-bye.